tonight. Welcome to the first episode of Ben Davies Off Script. I've been waiting a long time to do this. I've been very excited to uh, actually start my own podcast and be able to talk about stuff during the week, all the news, all the entertainment stuff going on. And obviously this week is extremely exciting for me because Courageous Legacy is coming out next week. That is Thursday, the 24th. If you didn't know that, you're welcome. And please go get your tickets now. It's fantastic. Um, I'll dig more and or dive more into Courageous Legacy later in the show. But um, there's so much to get to today. I mean, I have the NFL going basically faux woke. I've got my meeting with Kirk Cameron that I cannot wait to talk to you guys about. And also, I'm going to talk about The Matrix, which I know, you know, on its face doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I promise you, all these things are so connected. And uh, just to start things off today, I know you're probably thinking, like, how in the world is the NFL and The Matrix courageous all tied together? But trust me, we will get there. Um, <laughs> it was actually a lot of fun for me to put this show together because, obviously, I love movies. Um, I work in news and entertainment. So seeing how everything is so connected, the stories we tell each other and the things that you see every day on social media and the news, how everything is driven by a very specific narrative, just like in film, you know, there's an intention, there's a theme that people are trying to get across and the writers, the directors, the producers are all working together to make sure the audience, you, can uh, understand exactly what they want you to and uh, to take away what they want you to take away, if that makes any sense. So, but just to start off, because it is such a crazy week and I do work in news, I do have to start with the top stories of today, um, really of the week. And this is a shocking list I'm going to throw out to you. <laughs> this combination of three, I never thought I'd actually uh, string into one in one episode. But before we get started, just do you guys know, we're going on Facebook right now. However, if you could, when you get a chance, please go over to my YouTube page because right now Facebook has some crazy rules and regulations on it, which means that I can't talk about a lot of stuff that I do want to talk about. <laughs> and I'm going to have to speak very vaguely about certain things in the news, maybe a certain pandemic going on and certain treatments for it and that sort of thing that'll instantly get this stream taken down on Facebook. But if you could go over to YouTube as soon as we get a thousand subscribers, I'll be able to stream and cross post live both places at the same time. And then when you know we want to get to some more juicy stuff, maybe be a little more honest, we'll cut the Facebook stream, go to YouTube. Uh, but for now, uh, Facebook is where we're going to live. This is where this is where we're able to stream live currently. But uh, yeah, if you could and you get a chance, please go over to the uh, Ben Davies off script YouTube page, get us to a thousand, and we will start doing stuff over there. Anyway, top story of the week. Um, if you have been paying attention to the news, I really hope you did notice uh, this story of the recall in California. This has been going on for a long time. Obviously, I fled from California. I lived in Los Angeles for about seven or eight years. Uh, was doing acting and stuff out there. I started working for a news organization. I'm not sure I can mention right now. <laughs> started working for them, and then they fled California. Now I'm in Nashville. And I saw firsthand the way things just fell off a cliff in California. It was wild. I mean, I got there in 2013, and it was just the land flung of milk and honey. It was fantastic. This, the, the sun, the ocean, the breeze, the Hollywood being right there, being a young actor in Hollywood. How It was so cool to walk the Hollywood stars and go to acting classes, go to these auditions. It was paradise. And actually, the church community there was pretty fantastic, too, believe it or not. I didn't think that I'd be able to plug into such a great group of people, but it does exist and it was great. And then it was like each year just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And all the stories that you've heard about are true. Like, I mean, it just, it, even um, like Santa Monica Boulevard, Santa Monica Beach, one of the most beautiful places in California. It was just, you had to start stepping over people that were homeless just to get across to the, to walk in the sand. Like it got terrible, especially in North Hollywood crime was rampant. Anyway, Basically, California has been doing terrible. The lockdowns have had a ton of pushback and negative consequences. So people were very upset, obviously, with the current governor, Gavin Newsom. They got about two and a half million people to sign petitions to start a recall effort. Uh, and it turns out that there was not enough, quite enough momentum and our boy Larry Elder lost. Now, there has been, I mean, there have been a few shenanigans reported, as I'll show. Obviously, there were some viral videos of people trying to vote, um, most of them being Republican. I don't, you know, there's no way to verify all this, but most of the stories, the viral stories that came out um, were people that were Republican that said they had already voted. Regardless, you know, I'm sure everything is on the up and up. There's never any, you know, shenanigans that go on with elections. So Larry Elder's, uh, Recall effort failed, and Gavin Newsom is going to be continuing what he does in California. So a few things will happen from this. 
reality always reasserts itself in the end. There is a story that people will tell you constantly of like, oh, you should be happy with this. You will be happier with this. If you just live under these orders, I promise it'll be better. But reality will reassert itself in the end. No matter how beautiful they describe these ideas and these utopian you know, policies that they're going to implement and they're going to just eliminate pain and suffering or whatever, there is always a negative consequence you'll see most often with these cases. Number one being the mass exodus from California. And that's going to continue with this. I mean, the people that were sticking around with that shred of hope, okay, maybe we can turn the state around because this place is beautiful. It's awesome. It failed. So there's already been a ton of people moving out. Me, like myself, the company I'm with, we all moved. Actually, when I moved to Nashville, it's kind of a funny story. There was a, uh, the moving van dropped my stuff off and he's like dude i've done 10 trips today you know moving people in guess how many of those were from california and i was like i don't know he said nine out of ten <laughs> nine people so I just imagine now and your last shred of effort you know or of hope fades um I, I imagine the exodus from california will continue um and for people to be willing to uproot their lives their friends and family and career and have to move shows you how bad it is no matter what they say about, oh, you know, California is doing so great and oh, it's so beautiful and people are actually happy to check out these polls, then ain't, they ain't. Because they, the people do not, they're not willing to spend the money, take the risk, uproot their entire, you know, family and go somewhere else if things are so great. That's usually what people say about, oh, you know, these uh, communist countries do so well. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know anyone, I don't know anyone swimming through 200 miles of shark infested waters to get to a, you know, communist utopia that you speak of. But the reverse happens all the time. So anyway, unfortunately, California is going that route. Uh, that's that was the big news this week, I believe, on Wednesday. The next thing, which actually uh, the, both these stories are bigger news than my third one, but this one should be big news. Most people aren't going to really talk about it. But uh, if you've heard, General uh, Milley may have gone out of his way to undermine a sitting president and give aid or information without being too you know descriptive because of Facebook policies to a uh, foreign communist adversary. Uh, doesn't look very well for him. Uh, actually, I believe uh, Marco Rubio made a statement about this, and uh, he actually wrote, let's see, I write with great concern regarding the recent reporting that General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, worked to actively undermine the sitting commander-in-chief of the United States Armed Forces and contemplated a treasonous leak of classified information to the Chinese Communist Party. Yikes. If you know what it means to be accused of treason, that's not great. And, uh, you know, from someone who is as high up as Mark Rubio, that doesn't look good. Now, we're not going to know what's going to happen. The only reason I didn't lead with this story is oftentimes when people in politics get in trouble, nothing happens. Like, not, It's just always a major letdown. It's like, you know, the the fourth movie or fourth sequel of something. And then you're like, oh man, this one's, everyone says it's going to be great. And it like rarely, rarely is. Um, that's how I feel this is going to play out. It's just so easy to blame and obfuscate responsibility here. Plus the water's a little murky. Basically, uh, the, the correspondence with Mark Milley and the Chinese Communist Party were vague enough where maybe he's not in trouble but this was major news this week and would have massive implications however like i said because it's in government a lot of things you know don't pan out the way you want to uh it's over our third story this um will shock most of you that this i think this is the biggest story of the week and that would be our girl Nicki minaj Nicki Minaj normally has nothing to do with anything that I care about, whether it's music, entertainment, philosophy, whatever. But sometimes there is a, a figure in the culture that will take a stand and do something that is show, so shocking to the, the pro, prevailing narrative being pushed in social media, entertainment, in, in movies, like whatever, that it just absolutely like rocks the foundation of even the media, like even, even the news, the kind of more left-wing media lost their minds because one person, one person that had been praised and propped up in the, uh, in like the new current progressive culture deviated from the narrative, the story that's being told for a moment. Basically there was the Met Gal this week, which was that ridiculous ball in New York where people pay $30,000 a plate to, uh, basically, be the Hunger Games, the the capital city Hunger Games scene. <laughs> That's like pretty much what it looks like. These unbelievably strange outfits and uh, and you know high wig celebrities walking around everywhere. Anyway, 
Nick Minaj posted that she wasn't going to go. Uh, she wasn't going to get a, I, I can't even say this word on Facebook, so please excuse me. As soon as we get to YouTube, I will. Uh, a treatment for a current, you know, problem disease going on. She wasn't going to get that, uh, mainly because she just had a baby, but she, and she wasn't going to go to the Met Gala anyway. But she posted about it and then gave an anecdotal story about her cousin in Trinidad and Tobago having a negative effect from something. Anyway, people lost their minds. Like, it, it was absolutely nuts to see people freak out on social media. You know, I'm, pl I'm plugged in the news quite a bit, and getting to see the reaction was hilarious. And it, the most interesting to me was, the, first, the pushback, and how much the crackdown is if you deviate from that new, this new progressive ideology, this, uh, this, this new religion. I mean, it's basically apostasy if you disobey. And apostasy was, you know, basically if you are killed for leaving the religion or the faith. The, uh, on, if you are a member of the progressive left and you deviate from that narrative, you, it is basically apostasy. And now she is public enemy number one. And like I said, normally I never pay attention, but it was just so fascinating to see that. And now you see some unlikely alliances forming. And this is, this may be even as you see here, Tucker Carlson did a, uh, a story on Nicki Minaj and, and now you see these, you, you see a few people kind of waking up to what's going on. Uh, a lot of times this is called when someone, when you believe something or you've been told a story and all of a sudden it you kind of cracks and you can see behind the curtain, you, the, the veneer kind of breaks a little bit. It's called, the term is called being red pilled, which is how we're all going to tie this into the matrix. But basically what that idea is, is you, you've been living this, this reality so long, but then one thing happens and you're like, wait a second, I know that's not true. Wait, that person was lying to me. That, that doesn't make any sense. And like, I did this thing and now why is this happening? And then all of a sudden once... Once the, you take the red pill, once you understand this one point to, to, that you thought was an obvious truth is now no longer true, all of a sudden, the curtain kind of pulls back altogether. Like all these different pillars start to fall that have, that have held up this, this narrative, this story, this understanding of the world. A lot of times this is, this is embodied so perfectly with kind of the, the mainstream media homogeny where they keep telling you the story over and over and over again. Like... But, but you know it's not true. You're like, well, th th we can't be living in a systemically racist country or, or whatever the story is because I've, I've seen A, B, C, and D. Like, I know this to be true, but yet you keep telling me this is the number one thing to be concerned about. And, and all these different stories, you, you hear this oftentimes and people giving their testimonies on YouTube or Facebook about this. But for such a high-profile person as Nicki Minaj with her, you know, 20 million followers or whatever, this is a fascinating story. And I don't know where this is going to land. That's one of the reasons why I thought this was so important to kind of like lead off the show with. Because you see a person who has a lot of influence, you know, whether deserved or not, has a lot of influence. A lot of people listen to her. And for the first time, that veneer is cracking. That red pill is starting to get through. Um, there really is that. And it's it's hard to do that, which is why I think the story is so important to, to crack that veneer. And that brings me back to The Matrix 1 because the new Matrix movie is coming out, but also because uh, we're going to be reviewing some trailers at the end of the show. So please stick around for that. If you have not seen Courageous, I'm actually going to watch with you the uh, Courageous Legacy trailer and give you some behind the scenes insight into how we did the shots, what happened with Alex Kendrick, maybe some accidents that happened to me on the set uh, for some of these scenes. But the first trailer that I do want to uh, take a look at is The Matrix. Now, if you remember what The Matrix is, you probably are wondering, like, why I'm talking about this on a you know more Christian entertainment podcast. But uh, believe it or not, the first time I heard about the Matrix growing up, um, I was at Belmont Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I know, shocking. Yeah, Belmont Baptist Church was playing a clip, and it was so funny because you know I was as soon as uh, the pastor showed the red pill, blue pill uh, clip, the, the whole audience just lost their mind because all all the you know younger teenagers that were allowed to go see an R-rated movie. They were like, oh, they're so excited to like have the Matrix being shown in church. But if you have not seen it, I'm just going to play a clip for you so you can kind of get what I'm talking about and how we're going to tie this into all the other stuff going on. Let's see here. Start it up. What is happening to me? The answer is out there, Neo. It's the question that drives us. Oh, what is the Matrix? The Matrix is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? They're watching you, Neo. So many famous Human names in this movie. Human beings are a disease. You are a cancer of this planet. And we are the cure. <laughs> 
How many times have you heard that, that human beings are the cancer of this planet? You know, we're just destroying it and, you know, we are the cure. We're just going to exterminate all the people. Basically, if you have not seen The Matrix, there's this guy named Neo. His, and it's basically an anagram for the one. And he is basically, especially in the first movie, a messianic figure. And he uh, he's living in the real world. But it turns out the real world is fake. It's this digital reality that is propped up to keep you kind of in this prison. This almost like this utopian kind of prison. So these machines can use the humans as fuel and as energy. And uh, what happens is this guy, Neo, is is met by Morpheus and Morpheus tells him what's going on it like bit by bits like uh very carefully because it's a lot to take in to think that your reality is not you know what it seems and he has that famous scene with the red pill and the blue pill and he says if you take the red pill i'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goals how deep the rabbit hole goes and uh, one thing specifically too that he he promises too is just he's like i'm only offering the truth it's not going to be a utopia or something you know super great when you get to when you see beyond the the curtain that you're allowed to see and so neo does this and he's awoken into the real world and uh, it, it's just this fantastic sci-fi action movie with a lot of unbelievable uh, metaphors and uh, lessons to be learned from, which is why I even listened to some church services that had mentioned this. You know, we understand this physical world, but there's also a spiritual world beyond this that, you know, the Bible says we don't struggle with flesh and blood, but with principalities. And th that is kind of a glimpse into what's really going on. These machines can come into that the matrix and mess with people. Then it can anyone that has not been awoken, you know, maybe... Maybe you could say even saved. Uh, anyone that is not saved or have been awoken in the matrix, they can be taken over by a machine and instantly like attack you and, and mess up you on your mess you up on your journey. So it's this really famous, famous movie. And uh, one of the reasons I like to to bring that up when I talk to people about you know politics and the news or, or, or movies is because so often we are living in a type of modern day matrix where you're told these stories over and over and over again, like. In school, what to fear, you know, rewriting history, or go, every time you go on social media, they prop up certain people on purpose and downgrade other people to show you what you should aspire to be or what is important at the time or, or whatever. It's this, it's this milieu if, in movies, especially the past 20 years, where they'll prop up certain storylines and suppress other storylines, which is why I'm so excited for movies like Courageous actually to get back in theaters to, to bring a little truth to the cinema again. But um, it happens everywhere. Just an example of this in the news, this is a story that I found so fascinating, and I guarantee you that most of you have not even heard about. Um, how many people know know who Ralph Northam is? Now, Ralph Northam is the governor of Virginia. He is this guy. I'll bring him up for you. This guy right here. This is Governor Ralph Northam, and he did something you know quite interesting a couple times. Um, what if I told you the current sitting governor of Virginia was caught? Two years ago, in the height of Black Lives Matter, either in this photo, where he is either wearing blackface or wearing a Ku Klux Klan hood. Now, how many people, if your governor was caught doing this and was caught in scandal, uh, would keep his job? Probably none. Um, I'll let you take a guess of what his political party is. But what's even crazier than this, and I think, I mean that is way more even tragic than this are his current political stances. Cause you wonder like, how could a guy survive this kind of heat and this scandal um, as not even knowing if you were the guy wearing blackface or the KKK hood? Well, it turns out certain people uh, get certain passes and he has a radical stance on abortion. And I don't know if you've seen this clip, but it's, I mean, it, it is really shocking. I'll pull it up here in a second. The um, he was on the radio talking about this new, uh, abortion law and what would happen and I'm gonna let you take a look listen to this for yourself and you can maybe see why certain organizations or political parties may really go to bat for this guy even though he's in trouble and uh, first thing I would say is this is why decisions such as this should be made by providers uh, physicians uh, and uh, the uh, mothers uh, and fathers that that are involved um, there are you know when we talk about third trimester uh, abortions these are done uh, with the consent uh, of obviously the, the mother, with the consent uh, of the physicians, more than one physician, by the way. Um, and it's done in cases where there may be severe deformities, there may be a, a, a fetus that's non-viable. So in this particular example, uh, if a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. 
um, the infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, the infant would be resuscitated if, if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. So, so I think this was really blown out of proportion. Uh, but again, we want the government not to be involved. That's about in these- all I can take of that guy. Yes, we'll have this baby born, this human being, this this child of God is going to be on a table and we'll gather around and decide, you know, what we're going to do with it. The governor of Virginia talking about post-birth abortion murder is still the governor of Virginia. And th- this happened, this this video came out a couple years ago. This is actually right during the uh, the whole scandal with uh, whether he was wearing blackface or wearing the KKK hood, which is just... That's uh, just insane in of itself. But that video came out and barely hit the news. I mean, you may know because a lot of people watching are, on, are Christians and follow these kind of stories for pro-life. But people outside of the of the Christian circles would have no idea that either one of these things existed. Either one of them. like Because no matter how the social justice movement in the media claims to be trying to help various people, there is a very specific group of people that they're actually trying to help. And there's a very specific narrative they're following. And whether you're a you know successful black female singer, um, if you say one wrong thing, you are cast away. You're cast the wolves. But if you are in line with all the beliefs and obeying the party and doing what needs to be done and pushing these radical narratives, they will, they will get to, they will come, they will get your back no matter what. And that's basically what happened with Ralph Northam. Now I bring him up because this was so great because this was more recent. Now. In Virginia, this guy, talk about stories being told on purpose. This guy, Ralph Northam, was going to do a new time capsule um, at this monument in Virginia. And time capsule, if you don't know what time capsule is, is where you gather certain things together to show people 100 years from now, you know, what your society valued, what it was about, who these people were, and all this kind of stuff. Let me just, you're talking about towing the party line here. Let me just tell you a few things this guy put into this time capsule that, you know, their taxpayer dollars are going towards in Virginia and what they're going to be bearing and, you know, hopefully unveiling in 100 years or whatever. There is a Black Lives Matter activist with their with the power fist raised. There is an expired vial of COVID-19 Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> Another BLM sticker. Uh, an election officer badge from the 2020 elections. The people that were, you know, counting ballots for people in 2020 was something they really wanted to show were, you know, heroes and did everything perfect. And and on the up and up, everything was perfect there. A first lady face mask. So a face mask that was covering the first lady. I don't know why it was the first lady, but that's one in there. Um, A photo of a Virginia state police officer who was helping uh, fight or uh, push people away at the, the January 6th protests that they call the January 6th insurrection. That one, uh, a photo of a dude from Virginia that was there uh, protecting the Capitol. A photo of that person is going to be in this time capsule for 100 years. And a copy of the LGBTQ Richmond walking tour. <laughs> like, so t- tell me if this describes, you know, you or who you are. And like, does it, are these things that apply to, you know, the... The, the people of Virginia and, and speak for everybody and represent everybody or whatever? Or is, it, or is this pushing a very specific story? Is this propping up this, the matrix around people to know, okay, this is, this is what we were about. This is what was important. I, I, th- these were the issues that were the crisis at the time. Not these other things, not, not you know, partial birth abortions going on in Virginia or post-birth abortion. The, 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 the act of like murder of children, that was not that important. But man, the LGBTQ Richmond walking tour that oh man we we were all about that we were great people right that that story so encapsulated what i've been talking to people about about the milieu and the media and and movies and and so on and if you need like another if you're not into politics which i totally understand um but i just i I had to talk about northam because the dude is just so so annoying even if you're a big fan of uh sports okay uh if you follow the NFL, you know they've been really pushing a more inclusive, I say inclusive in quotes, inclusive progressive narrative of the commercials like NFL is, NFL is gay, NFL is lesbian, NFL is bi, like whatever. It's like NFL is everything, which, you know, NFL can't be everything. But they've really been pushing this narrative. And, you know, in sports, people that are uh, uh, in that community, the LGBTQ community, obviously are, are held in higher regard as far as uh, their, their uh, spotlight in the media and in the news, and, and so on and so forth. What if I told you, this past weekend, 
the biggest game of the year, the the biggest game on the prime um, prime time Monday night football to, to to close out the week, the biggest play, the game winning play was made by someone who is the first active openly gay player in the NFL. And please tell me if anyone's heard about this. I guarantee you, none of no one has. Now, I, obviously, uh, this guy's this guy's uh, life choices. You know, I, I I pray for him. I'm not talking about like in general about his uh, sexual orientation or whatever. I'm just pointing out that you know that they're propping certain people up. Like, I mean, Megan Rapino, for instance. If you don't know, I mean, I'm sure you guys know who, who Megan Rapino is. But Megan Rapino is the uh, openly lesbian uh, soccer player. She's past her prime. She's, she's 36. Yet she's always put up in the news. She's actually the spokeswoman for you know Victoria's Secret and Subway, and is frequently asked to come to the White House. And she protests the national anthem. She's one of the most prominent activists. Uh, in 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 America at the time, they did terrible, relatively speaking, in the Olympics, and she was everywhere in the news. Right, this guy, the first openly gay player, you didn't even hear a peep this whole week. Even with the NFL already promoting preseason, we are all about the gay community. We're all about this. You had someone that that should have like a national holiday at this point. The NFL should be like footage showing. He should be on the Wheaties box because man, the first openly gay, gay player just had a game winning play in the biggest game of the week. Not a peep. Do you know why? Because it turns out after uh, this guy came out of the closet and he was praised for like a total of one day in social media, it turns out that he was Republican. Let me just, re- <laughs> let me, let me read this for you. And you, and you can see this guy. You, you will never probably see him anywhere else. Um, yeah, th- this is Caleb. This is Caleb Nasser right here. And uh, let me just let me just read what happened, what was said about this guy once it came out that his uh, political beliefs didn't line up with um, the mainstream narrative. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is so great. Uh, Nasib has lived a sheltered life in, in a Philly suburb to parents who were very successful. Michael Sam, who was a previous uh, gay athlete who never who never was able to start because he wasn't wasn't as good, struggled to overcome great personal odds, including poverty, racism, and parents who were very religious. Oh, god, those, those religious parents are just the worst, right? And religious parents, but it gets worse upon closer inspection. It turns out that Carl Nassib is a Republican. Ugh. Gasp! He's a Republican who, at the very least, appears to be quite tolerant of Donald Trump. In fact, a picture of Nassib on Twitter shows him with an American flag bandana wrapped around his head next to his next to a friend with a Donald Trump shirt. Oh my goodness, stop the presses. That's what's wrong with this guy. He was a Republican. Oh my goodness. And it just so clearly shows this this fake world that is being propped up in the media and the news and in sports. Just it's so annoying. I, I, I wish they were just honest about it. It's like, oh, you know, we're we're for you know, diversity, and we want to prop up these marginalized communities or whatever, and it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> like, literally, as long as you voted the right way, they will prop you up. But if you didn't, oh, man, they will come for you. Like, I forgot which, uh, I'll have to post a link for this public, I forgot which uh, news article this was, but it was just, I could not believe they just, like, publicly attacked this guy because he wore an American flag bandana and was toler- at least tolerant of Donald Trump or whatever. It's just so crazy. Anyway, um, before I go any further, before I get uh, done with these these stories, I'm going to get into my conversation with Kurt Cameron here in a second, which actually will give us a little bit of hope because I know this is just kind of depressing and annoying. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, please, a reminder to uh, go like and subscribe. Please share this video. Um, obviously, this this uh, my format's going to change a little bit. I'll have some interviews hopefully coming up with some awesome people. And uh, I'll, I'll continue to give news and, and reviews and so on. But if you could, like I mentioned before, if you go over to the YouTube channel, because on YouTube, I'll be able to talk about more stuff and be a little more open and honest. But, you know, for Facebook, I got to keep it tame. Keeping it tame. Speaking of keeping it tame, one of the most tame people in the world, one of the best dudes I've ever met, Kurt Cameron. I was uh, with Kurt this past weekend. I hope I hope everyone listening subscribes to Kurt Cameron's channel. He's a fantastic dude. I mean, you talk about just being legit and being so cordial and great in person. Um, you know, there's a few people that I'll I'll talk about this probably at some point, but I've been fortunate to meet a couple great people in the industry. And it's great when people exceed your expectations. It's pretty rare because you you meet people and sometimes they have maybe a little bit of an ego, maybe they're just, they don't present the same way they do on camera, whatever. But Kurt is as legit as it comes. Anyway, he's been doing this fireside chat, uh, around the country 
starting last year, he, he did, uh, it was wildly successful on Facebook. Uh, so please go check out all of his videos there. But um, these fireside chats where he wants to start a revival in America. And because he, he knows the story that people are starting to walk in line with is not true. He knows the, the, the people living in this, especially people that are not in, in the church, these people that are walking around in this modern day matrix, he knows we, somehow we've got to reach them. And, and to do that, the first step is to get back to the word, the, the story that is always true, the story that should red pill and crack the veneer of all these moments that people are propping up like, oh, you know, we should be mad about this or we need to change this. And it's like, well, let me go back to the Bible and see what that says. And Kurt is definitely going about it the right way. Um, so he started these fireside chats where he'll do a Facebook Live and he'll just talk about history and the truth and like where we came from and what we can do and and, and how to handle these issues from a Christian perspective. And uh, he's going to be launching a new one starting in mid-October. So definitely tune into his channel to get all the, uh, the latest information on that. Um, let me just pull up briefly a uh, example of of what he was talking about the one that i went to on saturday he actually came to nashville and uh he was doing one with marshall foster who's a great guy that hopefully i'll get to have on at some point he's a brilliant historian and uh they were doing this and this was kind of i I like kurt's delivery on these because it's not just him venting like a little bit of what i'm doing right now uh he he wants it to be intentional like going to these fireside chats and starting a revival he wants these to be intentional with the plan and uh how do you how do you uh come up with a good battle plan well you go back to what's worked and you you listen to people that are smarter than you and here's a little bit of uh kirk cameron reading uh, some quotes from abraham lincoln that we should have done without a revival and I'm seeing this as our golden opportunity for revival. God is, has our attention. We are at a crossroads. I want to read something to you from um, Abraham Lincoln, who said this. Abraham Lincoln said, um, and this was during the, uh, in the dark days of the Civil War. He said this. He said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and in prosperity. We're celebrating the 400th year since the landing of the pilgrims. We have had an amazing history of blessings in this country. We've grown in numbers, wealth and power, more than any nation has ever known. We've, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. <laughs> by you, the way, I quit. Excuse me. I, you could interrupt me, but but hold on for President I Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can hear me laughing. We got a bunch of people sitting around here, so they're just they're laughing. Uh, and he and he says, intoxicated, drunk with our own unbroken success. You know, I hear so many politicians talk like that. You know, how great we are in this great democracy and the greatness and goodness of America. The only reason America is great is, is one president says because America is good. And the only reason America is good is because America acknowledges God. And if we ever fail to acknowledge God, we will cease to be good. We will cease to be great and we'll be in great trouble. Lincoln goes on to say, Get there, Kurt. We've become too proud to pray to the God that made us. You notice we have no moments of silence now rather, rather than prayer, just sort of like silent intentions rather than praying to the God who made us and established our nation. Nice. He says it behooves yeah, us. It's good it, for us. Kurt, we ought Kurt to do this. Actually he says like to the humble. Man. And uh, he goes on. Actually, Marshall talks about how they think that Abraham Lincoln, who was not uh, raised a Christian, actually got saved basically in the heat and the worst moments of the Civil War. And, you know, Kurt's talking about how we we got to turn back to God and give thanks. We're, we're, we're not great without him at all. You know, he, he, he identifies the problem and then Marshall kind of brings it back into the solution and the hope that we have right now, because time seems so bad right now. I, I get it. Like things are, are rough. California is continuing to become Sodom and Gomorrah every single day, and it's about to fall off the cliff, and they they couldn't get rid of Gavin Newsom. All these different issues. I get it. However, he Marshall uses the example of Abraham Lincoln, the worst possible time, the Civil War, the worst, the bloodiest battle that America ever had, war that America's ever had. 
this is where he gets saved and there's this massive revival that goes through the camps all these the, the tents around during the civil war and there's this huge revival and, and god really everyone turns back to him and the lord reshapes this country after the civil war and it was this beautiful example and it made me think right now like obviously we're in these difficult times but that is when god uses us the most that's when the most willing that's when we're the most willing to be the clay for him to mold is when we are fully surrender and we give up we give we give in to him and are like okay you know i'm going to fight i'm going to do whatever you want me to do take me and use me however you see fit and it was great to hear them talk about this in this moment in the civil war with abraham lincoln and it really made me think of alex kendrick and 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 uh even my my uh path into being in these in these christian movies because it wasn't like i just started on a journey one day it was like hey i want to be an actor and i want to be in these movies and be a part of this movie called courageous that came out 10 years ago um it was actually a very difficult and hard time for me personally i was a track athlete and i had been training to go to the olympics my entire life my entire life had been focused on this one goal of, of being the best and i I, I was on my way there to go to the Olympics and I broke these national records and I was a number recruit and everything was going well. And then all of a sudden I got injured. And when I got injured, I was praying and nothing was happening and no healing was happening. And then doctors came in and said, Ben, we had to do this major surgery. You may never be able to throw again. And it, for the first time in my life, I was willing to, you know, I was like, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because obviously the plans for my life may not be yours. And as soon as I got to that moment, that was when I got the call from my agent about this audition of this movie called Courageous in Albany, Georgia. And I, I went down there and I auditioned for the Kendrick brothers actually in a, in a sling. Like I was, I had to take my, well, I, I was actually able to take my arm out slightly and put it on my leg and act out this scene with like one arm. But um, it was wild because after this audition, I, I thought for sure there was no way I was going to get it. And when I was back in college, still in the sling, I got the call from my agent and said, you know, you booked this role and i had never been in any movie before this was the first time i'd ever been in a film was was courageous and it was at that moment i was i had the, that almost that audible moment of you, you little faith why did you doubt because you know you always have these you're like oh lord why did you not give me this or i wanted this and then there's this plan that the lord has for you if you are willing to you know submit to him and be the clay and in these difficult times you know that's when you can really draw into him and then there could be so much good that comes out of it and then using the examples that that uh, kurt and marshall were talking about and that brings us really to right now with Courageous and this critical moment for our country because I was at the time of Courageous when it came out, the theme of fatherhood and community and knowing what happens when the father does not live up to the expectations that Christ lays out from the Bible. You know, the repercussions of that in the, in the community, the inner cities especially, where uh, the, 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 the population there has extremely low rate of fatherhoods and the fathers in the home taking care and raising up the generation. Um, a movie addressing that, like it did with Courageous in 2011. I was like, oh, well, there couldn't be a better time for this movie, right? And then the Lord outdoes himself. <laughs> He's like, no, 10 years later in 2021, you know, I'm going to get this movie back out there, Courageous Legacy. And it was wild when I got the, the, the call. Alex called me up and was like, hey, we're going to reshoot. We're going to do an alternate ending. We're going to add back all these scenes. We're going to recut the movie, rescore it. It's going to be awesome. And it actually happened we started filming this right before all the riots popped off last year, you know, it's so now a year later, this movie gets to come back out and deliver this, you know, I'm praying that this is going to really move the country and kind of bring us back to him in this crisis moment. And Lord can speak the truth in this, in this movie. Um, I hope everyone has seen courageous. I have no idea. Like uh, the percent of people that, have, that watch this, who, who have seen it, but uh, before oh, the offended oops, sorry, that's Kurt again. Uh, but yeah, so, let me just. I want to watch the trailer again with you guys. The uh, the Courageous Legacy they released a brand new trailer for the movie, and uh, I wanted to give everyone a little behind the scenes peek into, you know, how we pulled off these shots and and, and what it was like, etc. So I'm gonna watch this with you guys and give you a little, a little behind the scenes. And if you haven't bought your tickets yet, please do next week, Thursday, 24th. Get your tickets. Uh, Courageous Legacy nationwide theaters it is going to be a lot of fun let's see here i believe every father should step up and answer the call so where are you men of courage Sheriff's office. <laughs> Thank 
I was sir. a child at no, the time. No, thank you. Deputy Thompson has now survived his rookie year. Yeah. That was actually one of the first scenes I shot um, in that in that uh, war room there for the, the cops. That was a lot of fun because that was the first time the whole cast was really doing stuff too. When do you get married? Have some kids. You're going to figure out real quick how much you don't know. <laughs> It's crazy. A lot of the guys when they were shooting this, I was the youngest guy on set by far. Like they were like all 10 years older than me. And now it's been 10 years later and now I'm their age. It's, just, it's wild. That comes full circle. It's Emily's piano recital. Can I talk to you? Can I suggest that you spend a little more time with him? All he wants to do is play video games and go run five miles. What are you doing home? They let me go. Dude. Javier was such a beloved character from this. I mean, Robert and I in person, me and him are really good friends. And uh, he just brought so much to the set. He was a great, we actually shot this uh, music video <laughs> behind the scenes and we can't release it because they can't get the rights to the, to the song, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, Robert was such a great dude. This is actually one of her, his first films. I think it was T.C. Stallings. I think this was like maybe his first film too. It was just crazy to see the people that were brought together for this film and what they've done since then. It's, uh, and then to have us all come back together 10 years later and, and regroup, it was, it was a lot of fun. You really feel like it messed up your childhood not having a dad more than you know adam i need you to come with me right now man if it wasn't for my family i'd be in a tailspin right now you do heal but you're never the same oh there's so many heavy moments in this movie if you haven't seen it in a while it's uh it's a tearjerker and you know you can laugh laugh cry I want to know what God expects of me. I, I'll say too, Alex Kendrick in this movie, he always uh, is hard on himself as an actor because he's, you know, obviously writes, he directs, he and his brother are this awesome duo for these projects. But uh, in that scene particularly where he was talking to, I believe, the uh, the counselor, the pastor, he was really nervous for, the, for that scene. And he was just, but then when he got in there, I mean, we all were praying for him, obviously. there's They had a designated prayer team on set to uh to to go through these scenes with us and and i i, I was seeking them out constantly because this is my first film and i was really nervous for these scenes but they had this awesome prayer team there and i prayed with them and then alex gave this unbelievable uh little, like scene and then a uh, fun fact too because they don't always just cry on camera uh alex i believe used a, a straw with menthols in it so you could blow like in his eyes and tear up immediately and then you just like go into the scene so it, it was uh he had the emotion and the physicality there which was awesome my life. Me down the road. I've been doing about half of what I should have been doing as a dad. You're being too hard on yourself. Now I am Revolution. Yeah, you've been a good enough father. I want to be a good enough father. Can I say this too? To find my way. I don't feel like I started well. I want to finish well. Give me you gonna do this? Gonna do it right. Something like this needs ceremony. Feel yeah, like a rich man. As your ah, ah, baby Ben. Did you see Baby Ben? <laughs> I want the very best for you. I promise to take care of you. Oh, all right. There's a nice little deleted scene moment. You get to see uh, in the, the future. Oh, that scene, by the way, that shootout at the end of the movie, it was the hottest day on set that I've ever done. I've been in part of probably 24, 25 films at this point. That was the hottest day I've ever had, and it was the first movie. My The rubber on the bottom of your shoes, like your, I was wearing like, people were wearing like sneakers and stuff, the glue would melt, so the sole would slide off. And then they had these ice packs on the cameras because the cameras were shutting off. And then there was bugs everywhere. So we were like wearing these like these napkin things. It was absolutely brutal. It was, it was like Satan himself was trying to get us not to do this scene in the movie. So where are you? Oh. Also, when they were running that chase scene, both guys pulled their hamstrings. <laughs> Alex Kendrick... And Ken Bevel both like hurt their hamstrings during this. And I was the only, I mean, I was a collegiate athlete at the time at, at uh, University of Florida. No, I was actually University of Georgia at the time. And uh, I didn't get to run at all the movie. I was driving the whole time. And then both these guys were running and doing all these stunts and scenes. And both of them pulled their <laughs> hamstrings. And by the grace of God, they were able to, to, to finish it. Men of courage. I believe every father should step up and answer the call. And to say, I will. I will. Courageous Legacy, 10 year anniversary. Get your tickets now. It's gonna be a whole lot of fun. Um, yeah, so I, what I love about that, it, oops, <laughs> what I love about that movie so much is there is this this narrative going on right now. There is a, a message being 
it's pervasive, it is corrosive, it's cancerous, it's everywhere, it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's in every movie, where they address these issues in our society and they give you this false villain, this, uh, this, this narrative that is completely contrived and detrimental to so much of the country is divisive. It's unhelpful because it doesn't actually, it doesn't address the fundamental problem and the issue. And then you have a movie like Courageous coming out. Um, the Lord's hopefully is going to broadcast to millions and millions of people that delivers a true message, a true solution, and I hope will be a red-pilled moment for so many people across the country who stumble in to finally get to see a movie in person and maybe have never heard of Courageous before and get to watch this movie because before the impact was tremendous. I remember, you know, as this young kid getting messages from people in like, Hungary and, and Croatia and the Philippines using Google Translate to message me, you know, one of the random supporting actor guys about how this movie changed their life forever. And I just pray that the same thing happens uh, this year with this movie coming out next week. I can't wait to see what happens. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to have Alex Kendrick on to talk about the movie next week for uh, another episode of Ben Davies Off Script. Um, but uh, please, I can't stress this enough, please go out and support the movie because every time, every ticket you buy is a vote for more of these kind of movies and messages to come out there. So I hope you do that. And uh, please let me know in the comments what you'd like for me to cover next. And I will see you guys next week.